what tree should you cut for whitetails? I get this question all the time. And there's a lot, there's a lot different approach for whitetails and wildlife than there is uh, timber management. Um, timber management, some of our best trees in here, and I'll point some out and maybe we'll walk up to them um, after, after we shoot the video, but there's a big red oak right over here. Got a pretty decent trunk on it for about 25 feet or so, and that'd be a good log. They, they could take out of here. And we have a few red oaks like that scattered through here. I imagine whoever did this cut, say seven to 10 years ago, um, that they left some of these red oaks for wildlife and some of the white oaks. So I'm really appreciative of that. And there's a lot of junk timber in here, which is one of the reasons that I actually really like um, this property. Uh, I want junk timber because junk timber the lower the timber value on a property, always keep in mind, the higher the wildlife value. So if you buy 160 acres of mature timber, that's one of the worst properties. It's not that you can't develop a plan for it. It just takes decades to put in place to attain the diversity and edge that you need for wildlife and whitetails on your land. And a woods full of valuable hardwoods is not the type of woods you want to buy or manage when it comes to building a, a whitetail purse. So I want to talk about some of the trees we're going to cut out here and what we're going to do with some of them and and why you need to be real careful with how you look at uh, timber and what type of timber is on the land. We have a beautiful white oak over here. It's starting to get a really good canopy on it and crown. You can see all the branches and what that means is high value acorns. You can see the red oak next to it over here, a little bit larger. The two are separated enough that they can both stand alone in the same spot. So what I'm doing is I'm focusing on a lot of the garbage around here. And what's really cool about this is we get this garbage down. I want that regeneration and I want um, there to be good regeneration and browse for deer that might be bedded in this location because this is one of our bedding areas. It's next to a food source. We're not going to hunt in here. We might hunt 100 yards that way and slip in on the end and, and capture this movement going side to side and parallel to the hill. I want to show you one of the trees right here. This is a box elder. And you tell this edge right here was open to the sunlight, you know, maybe pasture at some point. Box elder, you can tell by the smell. It's a very pungent smell. And I wish I could get you to smell that, but YouTube doesn't work that way. So you can always identify it by that smell. Very good regeneration value. The absolute worst thing that you could do if you're managing for cover, whitetails and wildlife, people will hack this, they'll spray chemical into it and kill it to promote the wildlife, quote, wildlife trees over there. Now I wanna have those acorns. I want those white oaks and red oaks in this woods and I think that's really cool to have them it's not a bad thing but that's not going to sustain the daytime browse and wildlife value on this property it's adding very minimal value in fact those canopies under it it's hard to get things to grow under it the sunlight's not hitting so we have that great mix in there where they have where we have red oak white oak that we're going to manage and you know we have two right here and then we have a decent red oak crown behind Dylan right back here and we have them situated know, every 50, 60, 70 yards. There's a decent oak on this property, maybe 100 yards here and there. And, and that's a good mix. So if you have a woods full of oaks, think about that. You don't need a woods full of oaks. That's a bad thing. People will, I've seen a stand of red oaks where they want to improve that stand. So they select cut a few of the red oaks so those dominant trees can produce that crown and produce acorns. And then they go kill all this junk out of here, whether it's poplar or box elder and uh, yeah, they're creating a woods where it's so open underneath. Acorns drop late September, October, they're gone. There's no cover and all the deer live on the neighbors. And I've seen that on client properties and that's not under a wildlife plan and that's not a wildlife plan. I want this regeneration of this, this box elder right here. It's so, so critical. We have a big ash right here and a small ash. That ash eventually is going to die. The emerald ash borer will be over here eventually. And so I wanna get these ash down now this smaller ash, I can hinge cut because it's in that six, eight inch size. And I'll drop the larger timber down first around it. So we have a cluster of maple I'm gonna get, get down right here. We have a big ash I'm gonna drop right here because it's worthless. Drop it down, 
will get great regeneration. I'll get great side cover because of the trunk and the top that's on the ground. And then I'll hinge cut the smaller ash and I'll get regeneration off the base of that ash. Deer love that regeneration, higher stem count so it's better cover. And then I can actually hinge cut that to that larger tree or some other mess around here. And I'm doing it in a way so the deer can weave through here and still get through here. The worst thing you do is block them. I saw a, cu a cutting on Instagram this morning actually. And it was, you know, five acres of trees cut down at knee level. And they even made up a fancy term for it. And, you know, there's probably no rhyme or reason to it, but the deer are blocked, they can't move through it. You know, it's great for rabbits, uh, squirrels don't mind, but the deer can't move through it and it's kind of useless, you know, kind of a waste of trees where you have to put a little bit more thought. If I'm making a cluster of cuttings right here, I want this open right here, open there, and I'm cutting. So you have a maze and pocket effect is what I started calling it about 15 years ago, where deer can maze and pocket. They have pockets they can bed in on these flats and these benches, and then they can still move between. It doesn't matter if it's a flat woods. That's how like the, they like to bed in upland cover. And so think about that when you're cutting, you're not cutting too much. I want these kind of trees right here. I want that box elder. You want that regeneration. You want this extended field edge in here. I'm actually gonna add red cedar to this area. So when you're thinking about cutting, if you have all open hardwoods, you're having a forest or a logger mark trees to remove. Make sure you're keeping a lot of your dominant species so you actually have acorns. But keep in mind that the oaks and acorns are a limited uh, value on your land they add to the daytime browse in bedding areas, that's it. I see people putting them out in food plots. Acorns aren't that much different in value than this hardwood regeneration and woody browse. It's not the same class of food, but it's the same digestibility and same value. And so woody browse, acorns, it's all, they all work together. I want soft mass out in my food plots, so completely different. In here, I wanna take down the big canopy maples. And in this maple cluster right here, it's got a lot of curve to it and, and it's bent. So there's not a lot of timber value. Now it's one thing you get into some of the Northern properties that go to, and they're all these beautiful straight uh, sugar maples, hard maples, where there's a huge amount of value, even uh, uh, cherry, they can be mixed with. And in that case, you wanna remove complete clusters and clear cuts so that you can change the diversity of that woods because that hardwood of cherry and of maple is extremely low value for all forms of wildlife. And so you want those clear cuts, add conifer to it, add poplar, hybrid poplars if you want to put them in there. They need to be protected. And then in this case, I'm going to be adding clusters of red cedar so that I can actually add that conifer, which is another form of bedding. And, and again, we're looking at areas that we want to actually promote the box elder in here. We have shag bar kickery, shag bar kickery, something like this. We're gonna cut down a lot of shoots per acre on shag bar kickery. Again, that's creating that side cover. So that's a tree I wanna get down because I want that canopy value. I want the canopy removed and I want that sunlight coming in. The more sunlight we can get to come into this area while promoting the oaks that are in here, removing some of the canopy maples, cutting down some of the shag bar kickery, the box elder, getting rid of the maple, then we can start to change this woods to the promotion of the high value acorn production with dominant trees and then getting this really high value. It's crazy how some of this box elder in here has really, you could tell, you know, box elder is an early successional tree. So you can tell it's pasture again, um, it had a good good amount of sunlight in this area, but then you look at a box elder like this We want to change the value of that box elder And you can see down here Where all these stems every one of these stems has been nipped and they continue to be nipped so that when you have a cluster of Growth nipped off and eaten then it keeps expanding with more so you see right here where this original this original branch was eaten off and then a bunch of other stems come from it. Great regeneration value. And, and again, that box elder, you see that little bit of green look on the inside, but it always has that telltale sign of box elder. You can see the wings and the great for finding these seeds and adding them to uh, uh, early successional growth pockets out in fields surrounded by switchgrass. So you can provide that food, harder regeneration and cover. 
and then you have that growth of switchgrass around it that actually protects the deer and wildlife within. But this tree needs to be cut. This tree is waiting to happen. But if I cut this tree and I cut any of this hardwood regeneration in here, potential hardwood regeneration, and there's no sunlight hitting it because I'm not taking down some of the big canopy trees of the undesirable maples, the ash, the shagbark hickory, then I can't get enough sunlight in here to promote the regeneration. Again, the worst thing, very bad. It looks cool to go in here and girdle these trees and hack and squirt, try to kill them, um, but it's the worst thing you could do. And, it's, and again, it's the opposite. You need to understand the difference between timber management and wildlife management. The difference was if I was managing just the timber in here, I'd focus on all the future harvestable species of trees. I'd kill the rest with hack and squirt. This woods becomes more open and I focus on those timber rotations of every seven, 10 years, 15 years, whatever it might be, depending on your location, how fast they grow and what type of timber you have. And then you're just managing for trees and boards per foot and dollars. Wildlife value is different. I don't see a logger coming in on my property um, because I have a lot of undesirables that I can cut down that are non-timber species. And then I have the right mix of junk timber that I can cut down. And in this case, with this box elder, this thing's leaning right here. There's a red oak right here that I, of course, want to maintain. I'll cut this, let it lay over, and then I'll leave it open around that area, but it's going to bring some canopy in. I'm going to cut some of these smaller trees in here to create that big hole of sunlight and all around that red oak and white oak. And it might even be that I'm cutting some red oaks and white oaks around this area too that are never going to grow into dominant species. They're going to be uh, subordinates or leaners. They're going to die eventually. They're never going to produce that mass crop and they're going to be poorly formed. So they're not going to be a timber species tree just because it's a red oak or a white oak. People say it's a sin to cut them down. Well, those people don't care about wildlife and whitetails. Because if you do, you want that regeneration value on the ground. You want those logs and tops for side cover on the ground. And you want to cut them down so it gives more power to these dominant white oaks and red oaks in here that you want to provide that timber value. So I know I'm going all over the place in here with different uh, recommendations and cuttings, but I hope in the end it makes some sense that I'm trying to identify future dominant trees that are good acorn producers, but it's a small percentage of the woods. They take up a high percentage of space. I'm cutting down high value wildlife trees like the bog, box elder, the ash. We have clusters of popple in here and other areas, and those are gonna, I can't wait to hit those because we'll cut down pockets of those. It might be a quarter to a half acre in size, and those will be evenly distributed around, distributed around the entire bowl here. And, uh, and those are great regeneration value, 7,000 shoots per acre great stem count, cover for grouse that we have here too, let alone wildlife cover for rabbits, and then escape cover for whitetails, bedding cover for whitetails with stem count and regeneration and food. So if you have all hardwoods, then think of it in reverse. You're identifying small clusters of mature dominant species you want to save. You're clear cutting a large pockets. You're leaving some of the mature timber on the outside to blow your scent into for hunting access. And also when you're on stand to blow into, so you're not blowing. After this is cut, we don't want to ever come in here. This is the day after the end of the season in Minnesota. So we're, we can freely move around. Look at, we're looking at beds right now, looking at trails. And truly this is an area I've never even stood in. So this is pretty awesome to be in a spot like this. And I'm very thankful for a lot of this junk timber. Don't kill it. Make sure it's a part of your, um, a part of your woods. And, and we have a very diverse woods here. And when you have diversity, you can create edge. When you have edge and diversity, you create a home for all kinds of wildlife, not just whitetails. And again, I talk about all the time, if you put a bullseye, you put whitetails in the middle of the bullseye, you create good whitetail cover and whitetail food and browse in your woodlots, upland areas, then you're gonna encompass a whole lot of wildlife that's all the way around the outside of that bullseye. If you're managing just for grouse, you get a little bit of whitetail cover, a little bit of rabbit, but it's not as encompassing. Same with pheasant, or certainly with quail. But when you start creating this, and this is just our wood lots, we have about 22 acres of edge around all of this woods in here, and we're putting um, pollinator blend strips in, so we have pheasants and birds and butterflies, bees, and then we have that switchgrass for screening and cover, and that switchgrass insulates this whole woods in here. 
and then we need to manage the woods. We have a lot to do in the off season. You know, last year we purchased property in early June. We just focused on where we could kill bucks. We were very successful with that on this property. We had a huge amount of success, shot five great bucks. And now going forward, I'd say the potential of this land right now, it's at a two or three out of 10. So we have a lot to do. We can kill deer on it, obviously, but we have a lot to do to the, the cover in here, the woods, that outside edge, food sources, strips, pollinator blends, access screening. And we're gonna take this property to a 10 out of 10 with just in a couple of years and we'll have the, the work that we'll have the hours to put into it and make it. And, uh, and then it's just more maintenance mode. Hope this helps you a little bit. Now, if you had conifers, let's say this is all conifer, think of it as that all hardwood stand where you're removing uh, 40, 50% total of that conifer. And, uh, and then you're creating those pockets on the inside. Even if it's red cedar in Iowa, Missouri, I see where they take out the entire stand, 40 acres of red cedar, and they replace it with hardwoods. And five years later, it's a bunch of stems and no deer or wildlife. What a missed opportunity. Whether it's white pines, spruce, red cedar, you're taking out pockets, 40, 50%. You're killing any conifer that comes into those pockets, allow it to get into hardwood regeneration, briars, browse. And uh, it makes sense, switchgrass is almost the same as conifer, meaning it's cover, thermal protection, but it's no food. It's a base form of cover. The hardwoods, you wanna take out large portions of a hardwoods, clear cut, change the woods. Hopefully you don't have a big stand of hardwoods that you have to manage going forward. Hopefully you have a lot of diversity like this. And hopefully you keep your hands off the hack and squirt and chemicals because a lot of times the trees you're hacking and squirting, like this beautiful, gnarly, old box elder waiting for some sunlight, waiting to happen, are the wrong trees that you're killing. You want these on your land. The ash, great regeneration. And, and even at emerald ash borer, I've been on a lot of properties and going back 10, 12 years where um, in central Michigan, you know, whole woodlots were destroyed. Had those been cut first and you get that young regeneration, then there is that thought that emerald ash borer pass through if you keep it in that young state that can't get into the bark and kill that tree for seven, eight years when it's young. And uh, if you keep cutting, you keep getting that young regeneration and uh, have a sustainable amount of ash on your land. Because again, diversity is great. Make sure you're cutting the right trees. I hope this helped. And, uh, and we're going to go through a lot of this in the off season, actually showing the cutting. This is our third video Dylan and I have shot today. Uh, we want to get out and hunt tomorrow, so I'm going to be gone for a couple weeks on clients in uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, and over into Ohio. Um, have a lot of, I, I actually had COVID early November, and just a little personal, but uh, Diane and I had COVID early November, and, uh, and we cleared up pretty quick. I had the fever off and on, you know, for seven, eight days. I probably pushed it hunting too much. Um, we have to walk up that 30 minute hill in, in Wisconsin. And, you know, towards the end, I probably went out a couple times I shouldn't. I, it, it, that, that I, it was 18 times I stopped to rest going up that hill that first time after COVID. And normally that's a three rest stop going up. So about uh, middle of December, sometime around there, I started developing some inflamed lungs. Uh, where it felt like someone was just pushing pressure on my upper chest up here every time I breathed. It was hard going up and down the stairs even. And they gave me some prednisone, said it was just, you know, complications from COVID a month earlier or whatever. Uh, I had to cancel my client trip and uh, I feel really recovered and strong now. But uh, we, that means that I have a lot more clients to go to in January and February as you make those up. But I'm starting that trip pretty soon. But you can bet when I'm back, we'll be cutting some timber shooting some videos and uh and really hoping i can help you guys with advice on your own whitetail and wildlife woodlots going throughout this winter because it, this is the time to cut and uh this is a great time for bedding area work and scouting that's what we're doing and trying to show you and i hope it all pays off with a lot of work going into this summer and a great hunt this fall now as we transition into habitat season i hope you've had a chance to check out my web class how to design your web your whitetail parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description, and I hope you can find it, check it out, and enjoy it this year.